So this morning we will be in continuing our study in the Gospel of John. So if you brought your Bibles, turn to John 2. We'll be in verses 12 through 22 this morning. We're going to look at an amazing passage that is uh, very applicable in our day in many different ways. So John 2, verses 12 through 22, it reads this. After this, he went down to Capernaum, Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area. Both sheep and cattle, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show to us to prove your authority to do all of this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. The Jews replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now as we met last week, we looked at Jesus' first sign that he did, which was a sign that he performed in the background, in private, where very few people knew that it was him who turned the water into wine. In contrast to this, we now see him out in the public eye where everyone can witness what he is doing in this situation that we will study today. But before we get into this passage specifically, there is a connection that needs to be made between the first sign of Jesus turning water into wine that we heard about last week and Jesus clearing the temple, which is our, which is our passage for today. The old custom of things was ceremonial washings in keeping with the law in a strict sense by all the religious people of the day. Also, Herod's temple was the physical place where people would be gathered to worship God. All that changes with the coming of Jesus. Jesus comes to fulfill all righteousness in ceremonial washings and everything else the law demanded. Through this righteousness, now he comes with the washing of regeneration, the being born again, the cleansing of the heart and soul. He comes with the powerful grace of cleansing the soul, where the sinner is cleansed from the inside out. He comes to obey the law in all its parts as the substitute for sinners, who can't do what the law requires them to do. He comes with a salvation that is by His grace alone and is dispensed according to His will to whom He chooses to reveal Himself to. He also came to be the true temple where the presence of God resides. And the true temple where in Him alone is the worship of God done in spirit and in truth. He is the temple, the new and abiding temple temple. Because he is the true temple, when he is united to us in salvation, then we become a temple of God's presence, which is experienced in its fullness when the Spirit comes at the, Pente at, at the day of Pentecost, inaugurating the day when the Spirit comes in fullness to flood the hearts of those that repent of their sin and believe in the Lord Jesus by this power of God. So out with the new, out with the old, and in with the new. Out with what has been corrupted, and in with what has been always perfect, because it resides in the perfect one, Jesus Christ, the true temple of God, and His wonderful, powerful 
grace. Both of these first situations with Jesus display who he is and what his grace is. The person and purpose of Jesus, which in a nutshell is the gospel. The gospel message about salvation. Now as we get into this passage today, we will first briefly go over the occasion, which was the Passover. Then with much of our focus, we will pull out the central principle to this passage and look at its meaning and its application for us specifically. Then we will finish where John finishes with the prediction, the prophecy that Jesus gives in foretelling his death and resurrection. So what was the occasion? It was the time of the Jewish Passover, which was an annual event that uh, was taking place over seven to eight days. Many people would travel from all over to gather into Jerusalem and into the temple specifically. There were many different areas that made up the whole temple itself. There were small shops on the outer wall of the temple. There were, there were ritual bathhouses for cleansing before entering the temple. There was an area where that Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, met. There were pools to wash sacrificial animals. There was a court for women, which was in the inner complex where women could enter. There was a court of the Gentiles where they and non-purified Jews could worship. And there was walls and screens that separated these Gentiles and non-purified worshipers from the rest of the temple. And people would come from all over to this Passover, including Jesus. He did so to fulfill all righteousness. This was, was part of what he came to do. He did so by to obey God's law. This was part of his active obedience. This was a regular activity of a devout, every devout Jewish male that was over 12 years old. And this was the greatest of Jewish events. Now upon entering the temple, he witnessed people buying and selling animals and exchanging money. So Jesus, displaying his power and authority, he cleared out everyone, including the animals, and turned over the money table. This was his temple, his father's house, and those participating in this were defiling his temple, his place of worship, and offending his holiness. So with all authority, he cleanses it. He was doing what Psalm 69.9 said about him, which is quoted in verse, verse 17. Zeal for your house will consume me. This is the message. This is the title of this message, by the way. The central focus here. His passionate burning fire within him for his father's house, for his holiness and reverence swallowed him up. The, the desire to keep his father's house a place of worship consumed him. The desire to keep it pure consumed him. So when he saw activities that defiled that, he burned with a righteous anger. A righteous anger. And he had the authority to act on it because he was the temple. Because he is God. Which was to be made known through his authority in this situation. So this buying and selling was for those who traveled to Jerusalem. So that there they could buy what they needed for the festival and could change currency. This was supposed to provide a service for these travelers to make it easier on them. But there was a problem with this. And the problem lie in where this was happening. Where they were doing this. The place where this was happening was in the outer court area. That was for the Gentiles and non-purified Jews to worship. It was in their area of worship. This is key because if this was happening outside of the whole temple itself, then Jesus wouldn't have done this. 
This is what caused Jesus to burn with righteous anger because this had to do with worship. That is very important to keep in mind as we, as we progress through this. This buying and selling that was going on created a barrier for people in their worship of God and kept them from doing so. This is the principal meaning for what is taking place here. Something was keeping people from and getting in the way of their worship of God. By this, God's holiness and reverence that he deserved was defiled. And his house was defiled. This is the principle that we need to take from this and faithfully bring over to our circumstances. This had to do with worship. This really didn't have to do with money or the receiving of money. That was just part of the circumstance that we see happening. So to apply this to us with a central focus on money really isn't a faithful application. Like this isn't saying to a church nowadays that it can't have separate fundraising in addition to regular offerings, for example. Or any other variation of that type of application doesn't necessarily fit in the principle of this passage. Though the general fund of the church should be supported solely by the regular giving of its congregation, this isn't saying that other additions to a general fund of sorts from other sources like fundraising is a no-no. It's not saying that. Now, there is a lot to be said about how each church functions financially, but that's a tangent that this passage does not take us on. So we don't go there. So to make the principle even clearer, if this was today, it would be like if our church, for some reason, which we would never do, for some reason, we separated classes of people. And the upper class, people would worship upstairs in the sanctuary. But the middle and lower class people were not allowed to worship up there. Instead, they had to worship over in the fellowship hall. Then on a big annual occasion, we decided to have our Chinese auction in the fellowship hall during that time. And by doing this, uh, the, the middle and lower class people wouldn't be able to worship and if Jesus was there, he would clear out our fellowship hall with his righteous anger we see here because we were keeping people from worshiping God by our Chinese auction. That would be a modern day scenario that would mirror this passage. So what's the principle that can help us apply this more thoroughly? The principle is if there is something in the way that hinders people's worship of God or completely takes it away so that they can't worship God, then it ought to be cleared out, cleansed of. Something that is an unnecessary barrier that keeps someone from worshiping God the way that he, is, that he should be worshipped. His house is a house of reverence. His house is holy because he is holy. So this is so this worship of God and his house are defiled if barriers are in place are erected. What can be barriers today that are based off of this principle in this passage? Well, one is entertainment. If the music during worship isn't a direct path to God, but a means for entertainment for us, then it's a barrier. It keeps people from worshiping God the way He is to be worshipped. This can be tough to navigate because the barrier could either be set up by the church or it could be set up by the individual worshiper. Many churches today seek to be more edgy, more hip, more entertaining. So that they can appeal to the younger generations. That can be an easy way for people uh, to keep people away from worshiping God truly. Elements of this tactic take people away from God and keep them onto the music itself 
or the emotional experience that can come from music or the atmosphere itself. Now, there's nothing wrong with music at all. But if it's not a direct path to God, but a source of entertainment, then it keeps us from worshiping God. Also, the individuals need to really check themselves about what they desire in their worship music. Many people just want, are just wanting to listen to their type of music. So they find a church based on that. A church that fits their criteria based on uh, their perception of what church should be for them. And many people grumble when the songs that are played don't tickle their fancy. When they may have just missed a really rich song with sound biblical truth in it. A song that describes God in truth and glorifies God through that truth. They miss it because it's not to their liking. We can do this when we are so set on hymns from our traditions that when we hear a contemporary tune, a tune we are immediately shut off. We're immediately shut off. Or vice versa. We can be so into the contemporary that we disdain the theologically rich hymns. Because to us, they don't sound good or catchy. Of first importance in a song are the words. That is the first element that brings us to worship God. So no matter what the song is, no matter if we like it, in our opinion, we listen to the words and that should drive us to God. Another barrier that can be created is from our traditions themselves. We can easily set up barriers in front of Jesus that keep, it, that keep people from worshiping him. We can get so set in our ways that if the traditions of our worship service aren't just right, we grumble about it. When that happens, we do not worship God. Instead, we worship our traditions. Traditions can be a very dangerous one because we can pile up so many of them that soon enough, we cannot even see Jesus anymore. Having candles in worship are not commanded in scripture for worship. Having beautiful stained glass is not commanded in Scripture for worship. Reciting the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed every week is not commanded in Scripture for worship. Wearing certain clothes or robes or gloves or whatever is not commanded in Scripture for worship. Having responsive readings multiple times a service, every service is not commanded in Scripture for for worship. Having certain flower arrangements or other decorations is not commanded in Scripture for worship. These can all be great things, but if they become a barrier between us and God and worshiping God, then that's dangerous, very dangerous. All of these and many more like them can be big hindrances for believers when they come to worship their God, their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when this happens, there is not a direct path to worshiping Jesus. There should never be anything in front of us, in our way, between us and Jesus. But God has given the means for worshiping Him. He has given this means in Scripture. He, he describes this. And the primary one is the preaching of the Word. That is supposed to be worship. Did you know that? Sitting under the preaching of the word, listening to the preaching of the word, is supposed to be worship? And the biggest form of worship in service for us? Then there is scripture reading, prayer, singing, and the ordinances of the church, that, of, of the Lord's Supper and baptism. These are the means in which God is instituted for us to worship Him. Truly, fully, completely, without any barrier. Another barrier that is one that has existed before this coronavirus, uh, but may be more of a problem after it has gone, is this. 
It's the convenience of the internet to so-called worship God as a member of the church and to do church in that way. To go to church online on a consistent basis most of the time is a barrier that we create in our laziness and our darkened understanding of what church is if we really do not have a good reason for it. We have come to believe that doing church online is a viable option. The church is to gather physically. Physically assembled together to worship with those means of worshiping God as God has set it up. As God it sets forth in his word of, of how is to worship him. And gathering as his church. Those means that I mentioned like sitting under the preaching of the word physically. Corporate prayer as one body physically. And participation in the ordinances together. Especially the Lord's Supper. Also, church discipline is a definitional aspect of a true church. And a believer can't be held accountable by a local church if they are always online. It just doesn't make any sense at all. Going to church online doesn't exist. Going to church online doesn't exist. So thinking that we can do church online regularly can be a major barrier in worshiping God properly and reverently. Now, certain circumstances, of course, call for it, as we are in our day today. But that is not a means to continue that. One more barrier that I want to mention is the barrier that can be put up within ourselves. In the New Testament, it says that we are God's temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. So as we come to worship God, as we are God's temple, what are some barriers that can keep us from worshiping God? I'll mention two main ones. A very common one is our distractions. We are such a distracted society with so much on our minds and such busy schedules that it can be very easy to not worship God because we are distracted. We must guard against any distraction that may come our way in each of our personal lives. Also, any unrepentant sin is a major barrier. The possibilities for each person in these areas are endless, so search your heart. If there is a sin that you have not repented of, do so and flee from it so that you can worship God fully. Completely, Search your own heart. But what sin does is it hardens our heart to God. It hardens our heart in worshiping Him. It can make us jaded or bitter. And when this happens, we are not worshiping God. This sin can be about ourselves. Or thoughts about, or thoughts about someone else, maybe in the church or outside the church. Or it can be sin that we commit outside the church. Now what are we to do about these barriers? We're to clear them out like Jesus clears out the temple. We should have a righteous anger that burns within us when we notice these barriers. And we should want them gone with force. Now in this, we need to be saturated with God's word so that we are biblical in our discernment. We're to navigate that terrain and act biblically in a controlled manner, especially when it has to do with situations outside of ourselves, like in the church or at, at work or wherever. There was a fortress that overlooked the temple where the Roman guard kept an eye on the temple. And if anything chaotic broke out, they were on it quick. But notice that doesn't happen here. If it did, it would have been recorded. Because it would have, had, it would have been a big deal. 
But Jesus clears out this whole area, people and animals, in all, and overturns the tables without an incident that called for the guards to come. He is cleansing his temple in sinless, righteous anger because his zeal for his father's house has consumed him. And he is seeing the worship of God defiled and his holiness and reverence offended and people unable to worship because of certain barriers that were put in place, which causes him to do something about it. Drives him to action. When we see this happening, we are to do something about it as well. In ourselves and in the church. In the church, in our capacity, given our role that we may have through biblical guidelines, we are to purify his church when it is necessary. God works through his people, causing them to notice this happening. And through them, he purifies his church. I'll give you an example of this. In 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34, Paul talks about the Lord's Supper, which is one way in which we worship God. But he says that there were some who defiled this worship and used it for a time of indulgence with food and drink. They took it too far. And by that, they were not worshiping God, but themselves. And he says that this takes place so that genuine believers will be recognized. God allows this to happen in the church so that genuine believers will be recognized. They will take the Lord's Supper seriously and do it properly according to Scripture, according to how it's set out by the apostles. And in that, true believers worship God in spirit and in truth with restraint on what can lead to sinful indulgences. So they are to cleanse the church. They are to purify the church. And they are to glorify God the way, his, the way he has set it up. The way as he describes it in his word. Now the greatest example of purifying the church historically was during the Reformation. From the 500s to the 1500s, there had been barrier after barrier erected that blocked people from worshiping God in spirit and in truth. The Roman Catholic Church had done this over time. One way is that they had instituted unbiblical sacraments that were added to the only two sacraments a church ought to acknowledge and participate in. So in addition to the Lord's Supper and Baptism, they added confirmation, penance, anointing of the sick, marriage, and other and holy orders. Now let me make it clear that marriage in this way was turned into a, a meritorious act, an act of merit, a sacrament of merit that gained favor with God, aiding in a sinner's salvation. It was part of how they were saved. And they did this with all the other sacraments. And even in the Lord's Supper and baptism, they also created barriers in this way. So their whole sacramental system kept people from worshiping God. And people started noticing this and doing something about it. It caused them to, to purify the church and to work towards that effort. This went deeper into their belief of salvation the Roman Catholic belief of salvation, of what grace is, of how someone is saved, and of what Jesus accomplished. This became corrupted in the church. Salvation turned into a works righteousness within the Catholic church. And all through this thousand year span, men stepped up to purify the church when they felt it absolutely necessary to do so. When they believed based on God's word, that this issue was too definitional to let slide. Men like William Tyndale, John Wycliffe, John Huss, John Knox, Ulrich Zwingli, Martin Luther, John Calvin, and many others sought to purify and cleanse, clean out the church. This is what brought about the five solas of the Reformation, where they came back to the teaching of Scripture alone, in order to clear out all the barriers that the church had uh, in those days put before people, which hindered 
and even fully kept them from worshiping God. In many cases, they were worshiping a false god because all of this stuff that was happening was idolatry. So believers are to be consumed with a zeal for the holiness and reverence of God and His house that is kept in line in accordance with God's truth. And Jesus being fully God during this life, it was in His nature to act on His righteous anger at the right moment in the right way. We ought to learn from the Reformation and from the biblical testimony because it this needs to happen today. Reformation needs to happen today. The church needs to be cleansed in a lot of ways. A lot of ways. And by clearing the temple, Jesus showed an authority that made the Jews demand an answer for this display of authority. The Jews demanded that he perform a sign to prove his authority, verse 18. But through but though Jesus heard them, Jesus didn't give them what they wanted. Instead, he foretold of his death and resurrection. He told them that they would destroy him and he would raise himself up in three days. In their spiritual ignorance, they didn't get it. They didn't get what he was saying. They didn't get that he was the coming Messiah, that he had come, God in the flesh, and the Messiah who came to, be, who came to die and be risen from the grave. The true temple. They didn't recognize this. They were, they were darkened in their understanding. His disciples knew that he was the Messiah. But they didn't fully understand in a different way what he was saying about his death and resurrection. Until he was raised from the grave. And when that happened, they recalled the Old Testament scriptures. The Old Testament teachings. And prophecies. And what Jesus himself had said. But in Jesus' statement, he said that he was the true temple. He was the true and lasting dwelling place of God because he is God. An amazing application of this for the believer is that when you are saved, you are united by the power of God to Jesus. You and him are made one. Because He dwells within you by His Spirit. The moment you are brought to life. The moment you are born again through the Gospel. The power of God using the Gospel to bring you to life. Showing your sin for what it truly is. And your repentance of that sin. And you coming to faith and trust in Christ. And Christ alone for your salvation. This means that you are now, uh, that you are not your own. But you are bought with a price. And you are God's dwelling place. One with God, in union with Jesus, owned by God. This part ties in with what last week said, when Jesus cleanses the soul by His grace as He causes someone to be born again. This means that you are not your own, but that you are God's now. Jesus, the true temple, cleanses your heart so that you can be made into the temple where God exists. Each believer is a temple of God. Therefore, we ought to treat ourselves as God's temple. Because we are, if you are in Christ. So be on guard for what may defile God's holiness. For what may defile what God has given us within us taking care of his temples, clearing out your temple of any barriers that you erect between you and God. What are they? What are they? What are the barriers that keep you from worshiping your God? Offer yourselves up as a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual act of worship, because our lives are not our own anymore. God resides in our heart. We have a new nature that God works within. So we ought to be diligent in clearing ourselves out, which is demands that we pray to God for Him to do this in us. Plus our direction and desire is to be used by God for His purpose and for His glory alone. And in this, we are consciously active 
So we ought to be very active in our cleaning ourselves out and crying out to God to create in me a new heart, to cleanse me of all of my unrighteousness, even that unrighteousness that still clings on to me, even when I'm saved. In our active life as Christians, we are to watch over His church as well, so that what the church believes and does brings glory to God. We are to reform the church when it needs it and do so on biblical grounds. When Jesus cleansed the temple, this also gave him an opportunity to reveal his death and resurrection when the Jews confronted him about what he did. And this gives us a further application to end with. Because what this also means, since Christ dwells in you if you are in Christ, And so you are God's temple. This means that your bodily resurrection is guaranteed. Because of Jesus' bodily resurrection. If Jesus is the true temple. And through his salvation by grace alone. You are united to him. Then what is true about him is and will be true about you. He will raise you up on the last day. He was raised from the dead, and so will all those who have been reserved in Jesus before the foundation of the world. Guaranteed, they will be raised as well. They will experience His resurrection for certain, because He is their representative, acting on their behalf. So what happened to Him will happen to them. His resurrection is the pattern to come. And those who are in Christ will follow His path. And at the end of that path is resurrection into glory. This is the focus. This is the focus on Jesus that maintains the Christian during all sorts of trials. They have an eternal focus, an eternal perspective, looking to when they will be raised in glory. And this brings up an excitement that bubbles in anticipation of that day when their physical death will just be a pathway to their full and complete eternal fellowship with their God where they will worship Him with absolutely no barriers for eternity. Does this excite you? Thinking of death, our death, our physical death in this capacity, does that actually excite you? There was a man who forsook his own righteousness and clung to the righteousness of Jesus. And he says this, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because his sake, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already made perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. This is Paul. He looks ahead to his resurrection with certainty because Jesus has made him his own. His own possession. It is certain, this resurrection. Because he has been covered with the righteousness that comes from God in Christ. And so he will be like Jesus in Jesus' death and resurrection. Guarantee. This should compel all of God's people to strive in discipline and in zeal. Biblical zeal to clean out themselves and the church 
of anything that keeps them from a pure worship of God according to his word. Jesus clearing the temple is about worship. So let us follow Jesus and clear out our temples and his church so we can worship and glorify God in spirit and in truth the way he ought to be. Let's pray.